So Brian is not here yet. Curry is here. Here, 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 yet. Rollins is not here, yet. Saunders is online. Shamblin? Yes. Here. 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 Be sure it's also online. Don't forget, online people, you have to send me the attendance words uh, at the end of the end of it. Otherwise, you don't get the attendance points. We've got a lot of people who attend online but then don't send the words. It's just not good. It's technically, if you did send the words, you can just log in, go back to sleep, say you were there, right? So that's one of the reasons I have to send words. But anyway, let's here we go again. Uh, we got another person. Yes, Young is also online. All right. So from the top, Bryant is here. Curry is here. Darby. Here. It's here. Fisher is online. Hamilton is here. Helmet. It's here. Ashley's here. Crystal's here. Taylor is not here. Morris is not here. Rollins is not here. Saunders is online. Chamberlain is here. Caleb Pierce is not here. Vargas is here. And Young is online. Did I miss anybody? That's eight. Let's get started. Um, yeah, so again, if you're online or if you've been absent, uh, remember you still have to do the attendance words. So if you're missing missing days, go back and watch the videos and you know, send the attendance words and screenshots. If you're online right now, make sure you see the attendance words when we're done. Um, and the first one, speaking of which, will be cell. Sometimes we're still talking about it. Cell is the first attendance word. So we're going to finish this chapter up. I mean, we really only have a couple slides, and we can jump into the next chapter. So we're almost right where we should be. Amazingly enough. Uh, well, really quickly, with announcements, as been the, has been the case with this course, there's all kinds of technical difficulties. So there's still one person who needs to take the exam. Uh, that is happening today. Um, and yeah, even if that doesn't happen today, then I'm still releasing it to everybody else. So starting tomorrow, you will be able to retake your exam, no matter what. We have more technical difficulties uh but just move forward anyway so if i have any questions about that sorry for the delay and the other thing the other announcement is my wife's band, my wife's band won't start this morning so after class i have to go back home so once again my office hours will be one so i won't physically be in my office today and norris is here i thought it seems to matter i think every time someone visits me they're not so he's online instead of the first one, which is I think better anyway. Anyway, so any questions about anything at all before we get started? Okay, let's jump back into the end of chapter three. We are talking about endocytosis. 
basically, again, to remind you of what we're talking about here, it's things coming in and out of the cell, right? You know, that was basically a big part of challenge. Really. How do we control things coming in and out of the cell? And this is where we were ending with. We talked about endocytosis, which was basically bringing a bunch of stuff in at once. So it's not diffusing across the membrane. It's not coming through a transport protein. It's like bringing in a lot of stuff. And I told you there's two different types that you might need to know about phagocytosis versus phenocytosis. One of them is uh, cellular eating because it's solid stuff. The other one is uh, liquids, which drinking. And I reminded you, uh, if you can remember Pinot Noir or Pinot Grigio with a wine that you drink, hopefully that'll help you remember that that's the type of uh, cellular drinking thing. This one's bringing in liquids. And then the opposite, this is what we did. We did talk about this on Friday, but exocytosis. So it really is just kind of like the opposite. So again, with endocytosis, excuse me, stuff comes in, right? And it just like the membrane kind of buds in around it, right? So you have a little vacuum. It's the opposite with that exocytosis. You have the vacuum, you have the vacuole, it kind of comes up to the I'll work out today. There we go. The vacuole comes up and emerges with the membrane and just kind of ex expels like a thing. Um, and yeah, that's basically moving a bunch of stuff outside of the cell. So there will be test questions, excuse me. There definitely are questions about this on the study guide. I'm not sure if I'm going to kind of go test yet. But it should be pretty simple. Endo means coming in and exo means going out. It's pretty simple to remember, right? It's a, kind of in the name. So don't, don't let that shoot you up. So like peers. For example, would be exo, right? Because tears come out. But you eating something would be endo, right? Because things are coming in. Anyway, any questions about exocytosis versus endocytosis? Okay, if you download the PowerPoint, you can watch this little video. That is the end of chapter three. Let's jump into chapter four. Chapter four, in my opinion, is the first hard chapter. This is one. Starts getting into stuff where you actually have to memorize things and remember how things work. I mean, I guess previously we were looking at memorizing things, and this is the first time we're looking at how things work. All right, chapter four. This is all about how cells obtain energy. I hate to put it this way, but I said this on Friday, but if you had to boil the last chapter down to one sentence, it's that cells need energy, and they usually get it from ATP, right? That's, if you had to boil it down to one sentence, that was the last chapter. So that being said, if cells need energy, and then they get it in the form of ATP, then where do we get ATP from? That's what this chapter is about, basically, how cells obtain energy. It's broken down into five sections. We have energy and metabolism, so you can learn some basics. Then, I don't really like the way this textbook does it, but I teach out of the textbook. Then we're going to go through all three steps um, of cellular respiration. Then we're going to talk about something called fermentation. And then finally, we're going to talk about connections to other metabolic pathways. So the learning objectives of the first one, you should be able to explain what metabolic pathways are. Um, state the first and second laws of thermodynamics. Explain the difference between kinetic and potential energy. Describe energonic and exogenic reactions and discuss how enzymes functions as molecular catalyst. And we've already talked about this a little bit. Um, same with energy. We've talked about energy before, we've talked about enzymes, so some of this should be not new to you. Bio bioenergetics, so this is, uh, I want to say new, but the old textbook didn't talk about this, so I'm not quite sure I'm gonna have it on the exam. Here it is. Bioenergetics describes concepts of energy flow through living systems. So again, how do you guys get energy? What do you do when you need energy? You're alive right now, so you must have energy. Where did you get your energy from? Food, right? You eat food. However, and as I mentioned this before, I'm sure I'll mention it again, ultimately, with a few exceptions, all the energy on Earth came from the sun. But you don't get energy from the sun, right? You can't just, like, when you're tired, you can't go outside naked, absorb all the sun. Like, all right, good, I don't need to eat now or sleep, right? You get your energy through food. So that's what we're talking about, right? We're going to talk about how energy flows through systems. This is going to be a concept that comes back a lot throughout the semester. And if you've had bio 108, you already should be familiar with this, this concept. Even though we never use the term bioenergetics, you still should be familiar with it. Um, this flow of energy is through a series of chemical reactions. You can learn about those chemical reactions. The Cliff Dokes versions of those chemical reactions. Um, it's actually a lot more complicated, but again, again, the Cliff Dokes versions. Um, 
And there's this word you do need to know, metabolism. Know what metabolism is. At the very least, that's going to be a question on the study guide. Um, it might be a question on the exam. Metabolism is all chemical reactions that take place inside cells. Which is a little bit hard, I think, because, you know, metabolism is one of those words that's used colloquially outside of biology, so you have to remember the difference between common use of the term and the biology use of the term. So any questions about this slide? Okay. Let's talk about metabolic pathways. There's two different types. You should know them, at the very least, for the study guide. There's the anabolic and the catabolic. Anabolic pathways needs energy, basically because you're building something. Anabolic is building, and catabolic basically breaking things down and it releases energy. So they're kind of the opposite of each other. So you should definitely know the difference. To help you remember, think about it like this. Cats are an invasive species. Anytime there's cats outside, they're breaking down an ecosystem. So if you can remember, Catabolic, you know, breaking down. It's like cats break down ecosystems. And again, the other part, you know, if you're breaking something down, that releases energy. That's a concept I mentioned earlier, and your book doesn't really talk a lot about it, but I think it's really important. I like to say it like this, and this is 100 percent true with this class, it's good enough. Basically, however much energy it took to build something, like a molecule. However much energy you use to build that, that's how much energy is released. Therefore, a molecule that took a lot of energy to build is going to be a high energy molecule. So if you break that molecule down, you're releasing that energy. Anyway, yeah, so know the difference between those two. And also, it's worth noting that both of those types need enzymes to make them happen. Without enzymes, we won't have any metabolic pathways. We won't have anabolic or catabolic. So anyway, any questions about this slide? All right, let's talk about thermodynamics. That is the study of energy and the energy transfer involving physical matter. So when we, just the terms you need to understand, not necessarily because I'm going to ask them on the exam, but the terms that we're going to use um, in this chapter and also the next chapter too. So the matter involved in this discussion is called the system. Um, put it next to this. We will talk about thermodynamics, but honestly, we're not going to talk about the system most, but very often. Uh, open system, that means energy can leave and transfer the surroundings. For example, this room is technically an open system, right? Yeah, we're cooling it, but technically, you know, the cold air is leaving the windows a little bit. It's leaving the door. Um, yeah, so anyway, I'll put it next to that because you definitely don't need to know the difference between a closed system and an open system on this course. Any questions about this slide? All right, you do need to know this. What is energy? This will be a test question. It's the ability to do work to create some kind of change. You don't need none of those examples, but you should be familiar with them, I'm sure. Electrical energy, right? You can use electrical energy to turn on a light or on a battery operated drill, listen to a Bluetooth speaker, right? Heat, that one's more. Everyone's familiar with that one. We talked about it a lot already in the semester. Obviously, light energy, chemical energy. That's going to be the one that we talked about a lot. Right there is chemical energy, but again, I don't need to write those down. I'm not going to ask you any examples. But yes, you definitely need to know that energy is the ability to do work or it creates some kind of change. Any questions about what energy is? All right, next word for attendance. I'll circle it. So if you're online, that's your word. You watch the video, you can send a screenshot of me pointing at the word. Excuse me. Anyway, any questions about that? All right, again, back to thermodynamics, you do need to know the first law. And if again, if you had bio 108, this is a review for you. First law of thermodynamics states energy can be transferred from one form to another. Type of there. But it cannot be created or destroyed. So energy can be transferred, but it cannot be created or destroyed. Don't let that fool you. So when we talk about photosynthesis, when we talk about respiration, keep in mind technically energy isn't being created, it's being transferred from one form to another. 
And obviously, life depends on the conversions of energy from one form to another. Even plants who directly use sunlight energy, as you're going to learn in the next chapter, they convert that light energy to chemical energy, and then they use that chemical energy to live. Like they don't directly use that sunlight energy to live. Even they have to convert it to another form of energy. That's what we'll talk about in these two chapters. So, as boring as this might be, if you're not into it, it's very important. Anyway, any questions about this slide? So, we're talking about energy, there's two types. I mentioned them briefly earlier. Can anybody tell me what the two basic types are? Like, yeah, there's electrical energy and uh, heat energy and light energy and all that. But when you boil it down, there's two basic types of energy. And I mentioned them earlier. You guys have probably heard it your whole life. Does anybody know what the two basic types of energy are? Shy. No one knows. Surely you know. You're just too shy to say it. I guess the first one, kinetic energy. You need to know this. That is the energy of motion. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. So, for example, heat energy that we talked about earlier, that is kinetic energy because that is the energy of the motion of molecules. So, what's the other one? Now that you know that one of them is kinetic energy, good. There you go. The other one is potential energy. And that is stored energy. Everybody knows that, right? You've grown up hearing this. I think that's one of the easier concepts. The place where it gets a little bit more complicated, but not that much. Potential energy itself is broken down into, I don't say broken down, describe it in ways. Again, it's the stored energy, regardless of what you're talking about. It's stored energy when we're talking about potential. But I think usually in science classes, one year in high school, or middle school, and they talk about potential energy. That's, the whole two things up, like, all right, which one has more potential? Well, and I'll ask you, which one has more potential energy right now, the orange or the green? Maybe you guys haven't heard this. Really? Right now, which one has more potential energy, orange or green? Orange, yeah, don't be shy. Yes, yeah, orange, right? Because it's higher. So when I drop them, that's going to have more energy. It's, just, it's just higher off the ground. I thought people were really familiar with that. But anyway, yes. So that's the one I thought everybody grew up learning. Um, but obviously in this class, that's actually not very important. The more important one for us is the structure thing. And again, that goes back to what I was saying about the molecules. However much energy it took to build that molecule, that's how much energy is going to be released. You break that molecule down. So molecules have potential energy due to their structure. All about that energy built in those chemical bonds. Any questions about this slide before I show you a picture that kind of shows the relationship between these two? All right, this is from your last textbook. This is a decent picture. So obviously in this system, this person has the greatest potential energy at that point because they're really high, as high as they're going to be. So that's potential energy. And then once they jump off, that potential energy is turned into kinetic energy. Remember that's the energy in motion as they fall. And then they get here, they hit the water, and that's the least potential energy. They move back to kinetic energy and the cycle. Pretty simple concept, right? If you download the PowerPoint, Watch this little video that talks about some energy concepts. So we're about to talk about them right now. Okay, heat. We talked about this already. Heat energy, but you need to know it. Again, like I said, it's a type of kinetic energy, and it's the random motion of matter. So you need to know that heat is the random motion of matter. Second thing, point you don't necessarily need to remember, but Heat is the most chaotic form of energy. It's the most disordered form of energy because, again, it's molecular, it's motion, right? So the higher things are, the more the moving, so the more chaotic it is. One thing you do need to know is this one right here. All energy conversions generate some heat. So when you go from one form of energy to the other, you generate some heat. Like, what is the temperature of a human? Does anybody know what your temperature is supposed to be? Close, right? Yep, 98.6 in Fahrenheit, right? And all that heat is coming from this, from the metabolism, right? Because we're doing all these chemical reactions. We're converting energy from one form to another. And when that happens, it generates heat. Um, and then this, I'm going to put it next to this. Every, uh, every book I read, Every textbook, biology textbook, every mentions entropy, 
but it's not important for you guys. So when you take a real chemistry class, you know, there's chemical reactions and there's uh, equations for them, and you have to account for the energy. Right? There's different forms of energy, and every bit has to be accounted for, which is why we have entropy. Mathematically, it is important when you go to chemistry. But for us, your book reads it up once and then never again. Right? So, in my opinion, it's not very important for our 101. It's in the textbook, so here it is. Entropy is the measure of disorder or randomness in a system. Every time energy is converted from one form to another, energy increases. So there it is. That's what your book says. I'm not going to ask you again. Any questions about this slide? All right, so that's heat energy. Here's the more important one as far as this, um, this chapter is concerned. Chemical energy. That is the more important one. Like I've already said, Molecules have a form of potential energy, and that is chemical energy. So that's the first thing you need to know. And like everybody said, chemical energy is a type of potential energy. So like I said, potential energy, there's energy stored either in its location, if I'm also looking at those markers, or its structure. And in this case, molecules, that's the structure, right? They have potential energy. We're going to call that chemical energy. So how many of you have tried to put two magnets together when they're both the same side, right? Like north and north, right? What happens when you try to do that? Yeah, like this picture, right? They resist, they don't want to go together. So can anybody tell me what's on the outside of an atom? Every atom, what's on the outside of an atom? Protons, neutrons, or electrons? Electrons, right? That's what's on the outside of an atom. And what charge are electrons? Anybody remember? Negative. Good. Yes, they're negative. So imagine when you're trying to bring two atoms together, as we talked about in the chemistry uh, chapter, that's a chemical reaction, right? You're trying to do four bonds. When you try to bring them together, those are two negative things, right? So they want to repel each other. So what's going to take energy to squish atoms together? However, again, however much energy it takes to squish them together, because again, they don't want to be together because of that negative, those negative electrons. However much energy it takes to build them is how much energy is going to be released. And that's why I have this picture of this crossbow, in case you're wondering. However much energy it took to pull that thing back, that's how much energy is there ready to be released when you pull the trigger. So in a sense, you could almost think of this as like a, a metaphor, chemical energy, right? That's the molecule. Put energy into it. It's clicked. It's safe. You can just leave it alone. It's just not going to release itself. If you do release it, so a lot of energy to be released. So any questions about chemical energy so far? All right. Cells and um, engines, like car engines, for example, at least if they're gasoline powered, they use the same basic process to make chemical energy that are stored in fuels available for work. We talked about this already. So when we talked about um, lipids, it's one of the things we talked about. So I already brought this up and bringing it up again. Basically what's happening, and whether it's gasoline, right, is octane, or triglycerides, which you should be familiar with, uh, chapter two. When you break them down, again, however much energy was used to build that molecule is going to be released. And that's what we do. That's what we do. That's what our cells do. That's what the engines do. We break down molecules, here we go, in the presence of oxygen to release energy, right? Same thing. And we also always have the same um, byproducts, which are carbon dioxide and water. So this is an important slide. I'm going to let this stay up here. These are things you definitely need to know. And we're going to bring it back so I can just take it again. But this is an important equation that you need to know, which is glucose plus oxygen gives us carbon dioxide and water. And in the process of breaking down that glucose in the presence of oxygen, it creates an ATP. Which is actually the purpose of studying the respiration. And yes, we lose a little bit of heat. But the important thing here is we're breaking down glucose in the presence of oxygen to make ATP. And in the process, we also make carbon dioxide. So that is an equation you definitely need to know. What was that equation? And I'm going to give it to you again, where it's actually written in an equation form instead of uh, visually like this. But are there any questions about this slide? All right. Cellular respiration, let's finally jump into it. This is what this chapter is actually about, just now I was getting to it. 
Cellular respiration is the energy releasing chemical breakdown of fuel molecules. You do not need to know the definition of cellular respiration. Cellular respiration is broken down into three stages, and you need to know those three stages. So most of this exam, at least for this part, is going to be like what happens in this stage, what happens in this stage, what happens in this stage. Or if you can remember back, here we go. I'll, be, I'll come back to this. But backing up, I'll ask you in which stage is glucose used? In which of the three stages is oxygen used? In which of the three stages is carbon dioxide produced? In which of the three stages is water produced? In which of the three stages is ATP produced? So before we jump into it, I'll go ahead and say now that's most of what this exam is going to be. It's going to be the three stages of cellular respiration. You say, in which stage does this happen? In which stage does that happen? So know that. But again, I'm just going to put next to this just to remind you. You don't need to know the definition of cellular respiration, but you need to know how it works. Anyway, but again, going back to the definition, again, it's the energy release and chemical breakdown of fuel molecules. And then once that releases energy, we store that energy in the form that the cells can use. I've already told you before, and I'm going to tell you again on the later slide, but I'll tell you right now, that form is ATP. Cells need ATP. And here's a word, here's a number I might ask you, and I'm not really big on numbers, but I might ask you this one. About 34% of food energy is converted to useful work, and the rest is released as body heat. This is why I have this infrared picture of somebody. So again, you're 98.6 degrees, that's where it comes from. Your body breaking down the, the food that you eat. And about 34 of that, 34% of that energy is actually used. The rest is lost to see. So any questions about the basics of side of the respiration before we jump into the three different stages? Let's see what time is it? Okay. Here we go. Let's talk about it. The first stage is glycolysis. There we go. I guess we can't do that yet. Sorry. Before we talk about that, I've got it's messed up. All right. First, we're talking about energy flow with chemical cycling. I apologize. I apologize. There we go. All life requires energy. So we already said but that. We already said that. That's kind of the review. I've already said this too. All the energy um, create, um, originates from the sun. So before we dive into the specifics of say the respiration, your book kind of talks about the big picture. So big picture, photosynthesis, you need to know this, it converts sunlight into energy, sunlight energy into chemical energy. And that'll be next chapter when we actually go into details about that. And your book points out that animals depend on this for food and other stuff. So we all know that photosynthesis is important. And actually, I'm just thinking about it, I'm gonna next to this too. Just like cellular respiration, I'm not gonna ask you the definition of photosynthesis. The photosynthesis is going to be the same thing. What stage is water used? What stage is sunlight energy used? And what stage is ATP created? Things like that. But anyway, let's talk more about this. I'm going to go through this quickly because we're going to talk about this later in the semester. So right now, it's just like an introduction. But plants and other autotrophs make their own organic matter, right? Using photosynthesis. So later in the semester, you really need to know what an autotroph is. And here you've been. Um, Introduced the term. So anything that makes its own energy, basically not takes its own energy, excuse me. Anything that makes its own organic matter, it's called an autotroph. And it's usually from sunlight. And again, there are some exceptions. So for independent work, you can look that up. What are the exceptions? You can look up the exceptions for autotrophs. Like what, what other things create their own, own organic matter, but they don't use sunlight energy to do it, or they get their energy. Anyway, the ones we're talking about, the photoautotrophs, I don't know why everyone didn't bring that up. They use carbon dioxide from the air, usually sometimes from the water. Um, they, they need water, and you'll see why later, and the minerals from the sea. But again, I'm going to go next to that. We'll dive into deeper detail later. So for now, again, I what an autotroph is. The opposite of an autotroph, technically, I guess you could say, <laughs> is a heterotroph. That's us. Things that need to eat other things, right? When we get our energy, we have to eat our energy, right? We don't have a way to convert sunlight energy into other energy. So we have to eat other stuff. Any questions about those two? Again, for this chapter, I'm not going to ask you about this. This exam, I'm not going to ask you about these two things. Likewise, this one here. Later, you're going to learn about producers and consumers. 
like really learn about them. This is just an introduction. So I'm going to see Daniel and Michael to ask you. But just so you know, autotrophs are producers, right? Because they're producing organic material. And yeah. heterotrophs are consumers because they're consuming it. If you have bio 108, again, you probably are already very familiar with all this, these concepts. But again, not going to be on this exam. We'll talk about it in greater detail later. So also I want to remind you again, the big thing we're talking about right now is chemical cycling, right? We're talking about how photosynthesis and cellular respiration are um, related. So again, we're going to talk about photosynthesis in more detail later, but for now, I'm just giving you the big picture. The book points out that the ingredients in photosynthesis are basically the opposite of or basically the products of respiration. We'll talk about that later, but yes. So again, if you take your notes, don't need to write this down yet, but the ingredients needed for photosynthesis carbon dioxide and water and again like your book points out the carbon dioxide usually comes from the air and the water usually comes from the soil but again your book's assuming we're talking about land-based plants but obviously there are exceptions any questions so far all right again this is big picture stuff same with this slide i'm just teaching out the textbook we're going to talk about this in more detail later but your book points out the chloroplasts use light energy they use that energy to rearrange the atoms and the ingredients to produce We'll need to know this later, but not necessarily right now. But this is what we're after glucose. And then also, there's other organic molecules, but again, what we're concerned about is the glucose. And of course, the byproduct of that is oxygen. So, big picture here. Now we've at least closed the loop, sort of. In the last chapter, I told you cells need ATP get in, you know, for energy. In this chapter, as I've already mentioned it, we get it from respiration, right? Respiration is used to make ATP. And as I've already mentioned, respiration is breaking down glucose to make ATP, right? So then the question was, well, where does the glucose come from? And glucose comes from photosynthesis. So that's the big picture of this entire exam. I guess you could say still have to have the sun energy. Sun energy, we use that in photosynthesis to make glucose. We break glucose down in respiration to make ATP. That is the big picture of this entire chapter. So any questions so far? And again, the crossbow. Every time you see a crossbow, this is, this is supposed to remind you, remember all that potential energy, right? So we use this sunlight energy to build that glucose molecule. It takes a lot of energy to build glucose, just like it takes energy to pull back the, um, pull back the crossbow. And the crossbow in this analogy is glucose. Glucose isn't going to just give off energy. It has a lot of energy, but it's not giving it off. Once you break it down, it's going to give it off. Just like this thing, put that energy into pulling it back, but it's just not going to shoot itself, right? That energy is ready to be used, but it won't happen to you pull the trigger. Uh, and again, your book talks about this. Animals and plants use the products of photosynthesis. And again, we're focusing on glucose, but there are other ones that we focus on glucose um, as a source of energy. And again, this is what cellular respiration is, right? Cellular so respiration is so when we break down glucose um, to release energy. Yeah, this is still the big picture. This is why I'm going to improve it. Respiration uses oxygen. Ah, yeah, you definitely need to know that. Know that. That might, that might be a test question. That's nah, probably not, because here's why. The test question is going to be, in which of the three stages is oxygen used in respiration? So I'm not going to ask you, probably, if respiration uses oxygen, because that other test question would give it away. Anyway, yes, respiration uses oxygen. It converts the energy into chemical bonds of organic fuels. Again, glucose is the one that we're going to focus on to form ATP. Then, as we already talked about, that ATP is used for work. And another thing you need to know, this definitely would be a test question, is this happens in the mitochondria. And I think I mentioned this on Friday. it will be a test question that someone's going to miss. And I have it on there because I think it's an easy question, because I, like, I like to have some easy questions on the exams. Um, so photosynthesis happens in chloroplast, and respiration happens in mitochondria. And the test question is going to be just like that. It'll say blank happens in the chloroplast, and blank happens in the mitochondria. Someone's going to miss it, so make this it. But again, remember, you've already been introduced to this concept. We're talking about cells in general. 
different parts of cells. I told you what the chloroplast was, I told you what mitochondria was, that's what we're going to talk about in greater detail later. So here we are. Really quickly, the waste products of uh, respiration, like we already said, are carbon dioxide and water. You need to know that. It should be easy to remember. So we're talking about cellular respiration here. But in a sense, it's obviously going to be related to respiration. So think about what you breathe in and what you breathe out, right? When you breathe out, breathing out carbon dioxide. How many of you ever, like, breathe out on a mirror or a glass? What happens when you do that? If I were to go breathe on that glass, what would happen? Yeah, fogs up, right? So that's another way to help you remember water is another byproduct. But again, I'm probably not necessarily going to ask you what the waste byproducts or the waste products are. I'm definitely going to say which of the three stages is carbon dioxide produced? Which of the three stages is water produced? But again, your book also points out that the waste products of uh, cellular respiration are the products that um, plants use for photosynthesis, which will be on the next slide. If there any questions about this slide, if the next attendance word, circling it, I'm not going to say it. I'm going to point to it. So if you're watching the video, not if you're live, but if you're watching the video later, take a picture of me pointing to it and send that in. Anyway, here's the chemical reaction. Let's give you the chemical formula for respiration. Again, glucose plus oxygen gives us carbon dioxide, water, and ATP. My suggestion is when you're studying, like what's up, yeah, along, got it. When you study this, I recommend memorizing that first. Memorize glucose plus oxygen will give you carbon dioxide and water and ATP. Once you have that memorized, then you can start worrying about the details. Which of the three stages uses the glucose? Which of the three stages uses oxygen? Which of the three stages produces carbon dioxide? Which of the three stages produces water? Which of the three stages um, produces ATP? You will need to know that, but for now, like I said, just try to memorize that. I will say this, despite what the textbook shows you, I'm not going to ask you the numbers. So yes, technically for air flow, I'm not going to say that. I might ask you that. So let's go ahead and talk about this case. For every one glucose, for every one molecule of glucose, you use six molecules of oxygen, six molecules of carbon dioxide, and you produce six molecules of carbon dioxide and six molecules. So basically it's a one to six ratio, which might be slightly easier. Remember, it's glucose, is C6H12O6. Anyway, any questions about the slide? All right, here's a visualization of everything we just said. It's photosynthesis, it's using the water and the carbon dioxide and the sunlight energy to produce glucose and oxygen. And then that glucose and oxygen is used in cellular respiration, right? We break down that glucose in the presence of oxygen to form ATP. And in the process of doing that, we form water. Carbon dioxide, again, second. Any questions about that? All right. Actually, 35 is a little early, but I want to end it there. That way, what we're going to do when we come back is actually get into the three stages. Now, now that we've had the big picture, we can talk about the specifics of it. Come back on Monday. I mean, Wednesday. So, any questions? All right. You guys have a good day. Thank <laughs> you.